On today's episode of Bring the Beat In, we're going to be bringing things all the way back to home base. As you know, WEAA was founded on the campus of Morgan State University, and we spend a lot of time on Bring the Beat In celebrating the talents that are already widely celebrated, but not everyone is too aware of the talents possessed right here on Morgan State's campus here in Baltimore. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to be spending today's episode celebrating those talents and letting you in on all of the magic that happens here. So on today's episode, I would like to introduce you to Kel Spencer. He is a Grammy-nominated songwriter with an extensive catalog that includes works involving greats like Rodney Jerkins or Dark Child, as you might know him, Wyclef, uh, Teddy Riley, close working relationship with MC Light, Will Smith, Mary J, Snoop. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Um, He's been named a BET Music Matters artist, a multimedia extraordinaire who calls himself the warrior poet. Welcome to Bring the Beat In, Kel. How are you? I am well. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. You did your homework. You did your homework. I I try. You know, we got to come, you know, prepared for these types of conversations because, (laughs) you know, you've put in work. A little bit, a little bit. A little, a little bit. bit, a little bit, a lot of bit. So let the people know if they don't know who Kel Spencer is, how would you define yourself? Who are you? And, you know, we're going to get into this extensive, crazy, you know, thing that you have done with your career. But, you know, let us know who you are. Um, Who, who I are. I think at the core, I'm a writer. Like I'm a, I'm, I'm a guy who um, I'm able to observe my surroundings package them with words and present them to the people in a way that they might enjoy. Um, clearly I've, I've done the most of that as a songwriter, but you know, I am an artist at heart. Uh, I've done some screenwriting. I'm actually in the process of releasing my first film, but I think at the core, at the core of it all, I'm a writer. Yeah. Tell me about the name, the warrior poet, where did that come from? Um, just, I'm just big on balance. Um, you know, my, my, my pastor, shout out to Pastor Bernard, CCC Brooklyn. He, uh, he teaches us that balance is the key to life, which I totally agree with. And I just think that, um, what it is that I do as a writer and as a creative and balancing that with the warrior part of me, I'm, I'm, I'm a Brooklyn boy. I'm a black man. I'm a father. I'm a husband, a protector, provider. So I just, I just try to live my life and approach my artistry with the balance and the dichotomy of a warrior poet. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. So you say you're a Brooklyn boy, right? Born and raised in Brooklyn. All right. But what brought you all the way to Baltimore? You know, how did Morgan State become part of your journey? So to be honest with you, when I was, I want to say maybe 12 or 13, my parents signed me up for an organization that gave a black, a, an HBCU tour. So I went with maybe a hundred other kids and we went to Morgan. There was during our spring break this particular year. We got in maybe five or six buses. We had hotel rooms set up along the way and we visited maybe 15 HBCUs, Morgan being one. And I remember distinctively Morgan Hampton and Howard being the three that I enjoyed the most. So this is 12, 13. So I go on to high school and then my junior, senior year of high school, when you're shopping around to really roll up your sleeves and get into the college thing. I was also playing sports at the time. And I was about to sign on with a school here in New York. And I ended up getting a letter from Morgan, from the athletic department. So it, it wasn't a scholarship offer, but it was a, hey, we, we've we noticed what you're doing up there in New York. We want to kind of extend an opportunity to walk on if that's something you're interested in. And with Morgan had, you know, Morgan already being in that top three schools that I remembered from the tour, I went down once again, took another tour. Now at this point in time, this is maybe four years later. So there were upgrades with the campus and you know, it, it just felt right at home. So I came on down to Morgan. I mean, clearly at some point in time, my love for music and business surpassed my love for sports. But that's initially what what, what drew me to Morgan. Proud of alumni. We're, you know, two alumni talking here. So, you know, that Morgan pride is all throughout this conversation. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about how being a student of the Earl G. Graves School of Business was a catalyst to you kind of being this business mogul. 
Wow. So it's funny. I um while I was at Morgan, people would ask, especially once the music started to kind of pick up a bit, people would ask, you know, in addition to the music, what else do you want to do? And I, I always wanted to have a media company. At the time, there was no Rock Nation. At the time, there was no translation, which is Steve Stout's company. But I had always envisioned having a company like that. I didn't necessarily just want to be a record label. I, I wanted to just be a multi-hyphenate creative media wheelhouse. And I didn't know how to describe that at the time. But while being a student at the Earl Grave School of Business and just, you know, my major was business administration, uh, minor in marketing, and me dabbling in music at the time and knowing at some point in time what I wanted to do, um, it just allowed me to, to, to fit in the classroom a little different. You know, a lot of people get wrapped up into getting grades just to get the degree and get out. I was a lot more concerned with, all right, how can I actually apply this to what I'm doing right now and what I plan to do in the future? Um, I think the biggest, the biggest um, plus, the biggest pro, and I'm, I'm sure this is common at, at many HBCUs, was I actually dropped out of Morgan mm -hmm. to pursue the record contract that I had on the table. But by way of the relationships that I was able to maintain over the years, and I I guess the understanding of the uniqueness of my situation, I was able to return years later and finish up. So I think that's probably another plus and another pro of being part of Morgan at large, but specifically the Earl Grey School of Business. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to age you here, mm -hmm. but, you know, this is circa, circa when, when, what, you know, what, what year are we talking? This is 2000, 2001. Okay. You know, and I went back to finish up in 2013. So okay. from August, 2013 to May of 2014, those two semesters was when I went back to finish. Now I hear about Morgan back in the day and how much it was referenced in music uh -huh. and how many celebrity pop-ups there were, you know, you got people like Fat Joe just coming through like, Hey, what's up? Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how that was and the truth behind that. Oh, very true. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Um, you know, and a lot of, a decent amount of uh, who's who's today in 2023 and 2024 were kind of just getting their feet wet or just experiencing the beginning of their trajectory at that point in time. So a, a mixtape in 2002, in 1999, in 2001 is a little different than what a mixtape means now. A mixtape back then was really where you could showcase who's coming and who's next. So if you listen to a mixtape and you might hear of a guy named Jay-Z who has one album out, who might might be a star one day or you know you hear an early mob deep um an, an earlier wu-tang you hear these guys on mixtapes they have one or two singles on the radio they have one or two videos out and then like you said they pop up under the bridge or they're the not even the headliner they're the opening act at homecoming and then you can kind of just grow with them over the years it 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 you know, is is I can't say it's nostalgic because you know they, clearly they're still around. But you know, there's, there's there's a synergy. Like there's almost like a stamp on that time of your life being the beginning of their career, the beginning of your college experience. So as their as their careers progressed, you know, synonymous with your life, there's you know there's that there's that lock and key memory and you know time stamp and you know just the ability to kind of have these people be the soundtrack to your growth into young adulthood. Yeah, absolutely. Did these young legends that you didn't know would have this type of effect on the industry, did them coming to an HBCU and merging kind of their aspirations with the community, keeping you guys involved, was that kind of a way that allowed you to see your vision clearly? Because I know you talked about the dichotomy like sports and music and choosing mm -hmm. a passion. Did that kind of narrow it in and make it real for you? Yeah. I, and, and the thing is, you know, clearly them physically being on the campus, you being able to touch them and give them a pound and talk to them, all of that is great. And, and, and it means what it means. But I think one of the more important 
elements of that is the is the unsaid thing in that of all the places they chose to hang out, they came to a college campus. So it says something about, hey, I'm this guy who grew up in, in, in the inner city with this ability to be an MC, be a producer. And I, I, I maybe I, I didn't have that college experience that maybe I kind of want to see what it's like. So let me go hang out on campus. And maybe they're going to hang out on campus to, to you know, holler at a couple of girls. I'm sure that's part of it too. But there's something to be said about the fact that in all of the other places, this budding star could have gone to hang out. They chose to come, come hang out on the campus. So they, it shows that there's some sort of a respect um, or an, even an intrigue by who we're looking at as a dope artist. And them being somewhat intrigued by the lifestyle that we're living here on here on this campus. Yeah, that's the part that I don't think gets said or noticed initially, but it's a cool little wrinkle in the middle of it all. No, absolutely. Thank you for adding that in. That makes complete sense and merges those two. I love that you said that. Mm -hmm. Now, talk to me about the transition. How did we become um, start at a, a, a Morgan alum and then become a BET Music Matters artist. Uh, what was that? How did that journey happen for you? Because I think a lot of young people don't know where to start or mm -hmm. they have these ambitions and just kind of sit on them. And, you know, dreams that are just dreams are just stay dreams. So mm -hmm. talk to me about that. So I um my situation was a little unique in that I while I was at Morgan, uh, you know, shout out to Kill, shout out to Baby Sam. I, I got my first radio play right here on WEAA. And from there, I got a decent enough buzz to start getting some spins on 92Q and then back here in New York. And so as the buzz started to grow, clearly I was doing more recording. I was, you know, putting more music out. And the idea of writing and or writing for other people had never come to mind. So Going from that space as an artist and my mind state being all artists to then being put in a position to be more of a writer and play the background, that it, it took some getting used to, but it was definitely a blessing because it, it sharpened my skills as a writer. So I think having the, the, the artist part of me in my arsenal and then going for the next 10 years as a writer and being blessed enough to be a part of some, you know, some memorable works that kind of um, opened the eyes of some of the folks, especially some of the people that I have relationships with at BET in these offices. You know, I'm allowed. Sorry about that. I'm allowed to actually uh, travel with some of the artists as they're promoting songs that are theirs, but that I was a part of. So it allows me to kind of go along for the ride. And, you know, at that point in time, Music Matters wasn't just focused on artists who are only in the forefront. They were kind of trying to recognize artists that may not necessarily as be, may not necessarily be as much in the forefront as they would like to be or as the um, the marketplace knows them for being. But these are some of the dope things that they've done behind the scenes. So, you know, you know, just to surmise it. Me starting as an artist and then being put in a position to be a songwriter and kind of having both of those abilities in my tool belt, I think that's what opened the eyes and, you know, got me that opportunity. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about and tell me if there's truth in this. Did you have to kill your ego a little bit at all? Um, because you talk about being an artist and then the songwriting aspect kind of taking a little time to get used to. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, um, if you haven't really done your homework, might think that there's really only one way. I want to be the forefront. I want to be the mm -hmm. artist. I want to be the face. But there's so much to do behind the scenes, being the artist, being the producer. There's a lot of money there as well. So mm -hmm. talk to me about that transition. Um, I think, so So to answer your question, there, there definitely was a degree of having to kill the ego. But I think I was fortunate enough to to be exposed to certain things that the average new artist is not exposed to as early in my career as I was. So I was just talking to somebody the other day and before I even signed my first deal, this was, I, I wanna say my junior year at Morgan. During that spring break, I was flown to LA. As soon as I got off the plane, I went right to 
the 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 video shoot for the Wild Wild West single for that song that summer. So I met Stevie Wonder. I had already known Cisco prior to that, just in Baltimore. But you know, chopped it up with Cisco on the set. So being exposed to not just the people, but some of the opportunities as early as I was, that kind of helped that transition. Like I don't think if I if I hadn't known that that some of the opportunities were available, I probably would be a bit more in my feelings. Like, I don't know if I want to do this writing thing. You know, I'm, I'm the MC. But now being put in position in, in these rooms and in these offices to see all of the other things that are out there, that helped the transition. So I didn't, you know, it wasn't as difficult to have to kill my ego because I could see all of the other opportunities there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You have that that vision. You have yeah. to look past the moment, and that's a, a really big skill that a lot of people have to take a long time to acquire. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to me about uh, Dark Child, mm-hmm. Rodney Jenkins. How did that happen? Oh man, that's a funny one. So we, um, he, I don't know if he still does this anymore. I haven't been in touch with Rodney in quite some time. But he would throw a barbecue at the time. He had a house in in Jersey, like near Atlantic City. So he would throw this huge barbecue every year. And right when I signed to Will's company, Overbrook Entertainment, my a and at the time, who had a relationship with Rodney, he brought me to this cookout this one summer. And um, Rodney was just launching his label and he had a pop group called So Plush. It was four young women. Kind of like a younger version of an In Vogue or along the lines of a Destiny's Child. But, you know, four girl group called So Plush and um, Omar was kind of letting Rodney know, listen, we know you're going to get some rappers on some of these songs. We just signed Cal. You got to get them on. So Rodney jokingly was like, can you can your pen do more than just hip hop? I'm like, yeah. He said, all right, cool, because we might need some writers as well. Fast forward to months later, we were in L.A. together at the same time. And Omar found out that Rodney was at whatever studio he was at. So we went up and crashed the session. And I said, What's, what, what you playing? He's like, yo, we working on a beat for So Plush. I said, yo, you asked, you asked me about my pen a couple of weeks ago. Like, you, 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 you want to try it out and see what it can do? He said, as a matter of fact, I do. Here. Right. He gave me a pen, a pad, and the key to his Bentley which was parked in the parking lot of the studio. <laughs> he said, this song right here needs a 16 for me. Let me see what you got. I said, all right, cool. So I go outside. I go in the parking lot. There's like four Bentleys back there. So I don't know which one is his. But I hit, I hit the key. It unlocked. I went in there. And we had CDs at the time. So I go start the car, pop the CD in. And at this point in time, it was probably maybe nine or 10 o'clock at night, L.A. time. So, you know, we're three hours ahead in New York. And I said, yo, and my pops, my pops liked Rodney music as a musician. I had I, it was one o'clock in the morning. My pops were asleep, but I had to call him. I said, yo, dad, guess what I'm doing right now? He's like, well, I said, yo, I'm in Rodney Jerkins Bentley. Writing two joints for him right now. He was like, you lying. You <laughs> And I wish we had, you know, FaceTime and all of that at the time. But I basically ended up writing two versions for him. He ended up picking one. Um, you know, the So Plush group, they might have had one or two singles that came out. But um, but yeah, nah, that was that was that was a cool experience. And that's how we linked up. Wow. 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 Really? And I have to ask you, I mean, we'll get into some of your more recent work with Snoop Dogg, but I love the movie Shark Tale. So tell me how mm. that happened. So, you know, obviously Will starring in the film, well, being the star voice in the film. And I want to say Overbrook may have done that soundtrack. I'm not 100% sure. But but anyway, um, they wanted to do the To Be Real song over. You got to be real. So they want they reached out to Will for him to lay a verse on it. And they wanted to tweak some of the lyrics for Mary J's part on that song. So I happen to be in the mix and in the middle of all of that. <laughs> so I gave a little something to Will. I gave a little something to Mary, and you know that was one of the that was one of the one of the hottest songs on that soundtrack. Yeah, it's sounding like you know preparation and opportunity 
meshing themselves perfectly with mm-hmm. a lot of the moments in your career and you being in the position where you can monopolize on that, you know, Absolutely. because of the first, uh, because of the uh, preparation that you've done. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, crazy, crazy, crazy. And let's talk about Snoop Dogg. I mean, the ESPYs yeah. and, you know, the tribute to Kobe Bryant, that was a huge moment. Yeah, man. I, um, I got a shout out my boy, Ariel. Um, Ariel's a dope engineer, uh, Grammy, Grammy nominated engineer. And, um, the first sports related song that I worked on Ariel, I want to say mixed it. This was back in 2002. We did the Ravens Super Bowl song. Wow. When they won their first Super Bowl, Ray Lewis in the, in the game. So I've known Ariel since then. And he had a friend at ESPN at the last minute, you know, obviously, you know, Kobe passing, I think touched us all in different ways, but you know, clearly that's something that the SB awards wanted to highlight that year. So a friend reached out to Ariel saying, listen, I don't have any MCs or writers in my Rolodex who can mesh music sports and, and, and a bit of a poetic approach that we want to take to this. Who do you have? Ariel said, I got the perfect person. <laughs> so Ariel called me. He put me on the, t- on the phone with Josh. Shout out to Josh and the crew over at, um, at ESPN. And they gave me their vision. They gave me their vision. Uh, what I like to do is in situations like that, I like to offer people multiple options. So they gave me their vision. I want to say I gave them three different versions of what they were looking for. And the, the the problem, which is a good problem, is they didn't know which one they liked the best. So it took us about two weeks to kind of go through each version. So the final product that you hear is actually a piece of each of the three versions. Um, We got it over to Snoop. And within 48 hours, it was recorded. And then, you know, you guys got to see it on the ESPY Awards, which was virtual that year because we were in the middle of the pandemic. And then, of course, you know, it was shared on social media. You know, I would have loved for it to have been the traditional SBs, you know, at the actual theater. But, you know, things happen the way they're supposed to. You're going to get that moment back. I promise (laughs) you. But do you have any advice? I mean, you've given so many gems and you've dropped so much of little, you know, monumental pieces in your career in this conversation do you have any gems for maybe some students in earl graves business school right now or somebody who is aspiring to get into maybe that business or just following their dreams and you know you've taken you you've taken what people i guess wouldn't call a traditional route i mean from mm-hmm. dropping out to coming back in to following and pursuing your dreams to dropping one dream and picking up another mm-hmm. give us some advice I think ultimately, and it's funny, I, I, I had this, this conversation with my seven-year-old this morning. I asked him what he wanted to be when he grows up. And he was like, you know, I, I don't know yet. And I said, that's cool. At seven, you don't necessarily have to know just yet. I said, but you definitely want to make sure that whatever you decide to do, you are adding value to people's lives. And that especially comes in handy in business and specifically with entrepreneurship. So to answer your question, I would just say that tap into your gift, which sounds ridiculously cliche, but tap into the thing that comes natural for you, the thing that you just how to, you just know how to do it without ever being taught, the thing you never had to take a class to do, the thing that people always come to you and say, you know what, you should be a so-and-so. You ever thought about being... And when they say that to you, you kind of brush it off like "Ah," because it comes so easy and natural to you. The thing that if you didn't have bills to pay, you do it for free. You know, that's a gift or those are gifts. So if you can find a way to bring that natural ability to the marketplace in, in a way that it adds value to other people's lives or it adds value to a system or some sort of organization, then you're going to be in a sweet spot and and it will feel less and less like work. And the more value you can bring to that space, the more money you make. And there you go. <laughs> what is next for Kel Spencer? What is next? Woo. So I am, I am currently cooking up my return to music mm-hmm. as an artist. Um, I have never really 
got my just due, which which is no one else's fault. Like I said, I, I place more of an emphasis on writing and entrepreneurship, but there's so much that I still have yet to do as an artist. And I'm thankful that the marketplace is um is open and welcome to 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 <laughs> to, to too much, but <laughs> the marketplace is flexible and open and welcome enough that if you're able to present something dope to a group of people who actually want to hear that, then, you know, you can create some synergy. So um, I shot a film last year. It's coming out on Amazon Prime and a few other streaming platforms. It's called The Big Fish. Um, I wrote it, co-starred in it, directed it. And of course, the soundtrack is going to be pretty much be my EP with, with, with a few other featured artists. Um, we have, well, Baltimore, we have Julito from The Wire. Um, in the film, we have um, a few social media personalities who, when you see them on screen, you'll recognize them. Shout out to Tahoe. Um, and I think I think people are going to enjoy this. It's it's like it's 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 kind of an ode to the movie Belly. Whoever remembers Belly. Um, but it's Belly meets the credit card scammer swiper world. So, yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, and I'm playing a character that is the furthest from my real life person <laughs> that you could possibly be. So I think that'd be cool for people to see. But um, that's that's what's coming next. Um, I started a brand called Playtime Worldwide many years ago, which is an adult events brand. Um, we, uh, we throw large scale game nights. Uh, we've done so in New York City and Atlanta for roughly five to six years. Of course, when the pandemic hit, that shut that down, but we are actually about to rebrand that. And um, there's going to be a podcast that goes along with that as well. And I'm doing that with another fellow Morgan Knight, uh, my boy Malik Bowie. So, um, so yeah, we got some things coming. So new music, new events, uh, a new film, and um, new life next year. Life. I love to hear it. I love to hear it. Congratulations on all that you've accomplished Thank and you. all that you have yet to accomplish. It's going far. You're doing amazing. You're making Morgan proud. Thank if people you. want to keep up with you and follow your journey along with you and support you, where can they do that? Oh, you can follow me at Kel Spencer, kelspencer.com. And um, I am um, I'm also trying to work on some stuff with the athletic department, just providing some soundtracks for the athletic department give y'all some in some in stadium bangers as well so we're working on that as well but uh but yeah i mean i'm here i'm not hard to find like coach prom says at kel spencer kelspencer.com morgan love always